Hello, everybody. Um, I am here to talk to you about treating depression without meds. So without further ado, let's get started. All right. So this is the overview of where we're going. I want to give you the end before we get to the beginning, but that's where we're headed. Okay, so a couple of disclaimers. Um, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. Talk to your doctor first. Talk to your therapist first. Um, I'm just like a social worker and your professor. And, um, you know, you should not take this as advice in any way, shape, or form. All right. Have that out of the way. Um, all right. So I think it's probably useful before we talk about um, how to treat depression um, without medication to talk a little bit about um, how history has seen depression um, and how treatment has gone so far. So um, way back in ancient times, depression was first conceived as a spiritual issue. So um, it was treated by priests, literally by priests. You know, you would, you would have like an exorcism basically. Um, and then there were um, the Greek philosophers and, and uh, the Roman philosophers, and they believed that it was caused by imbalanced humors. And, um, you know, as we move through the history of psychology and we get closer to, um, to modern times, you end up in, you know, the land of different uh, conceptualizations of psychology. And um, I just picked a small sampling of them. Pardon me, um, Freud considered that uh, it was a response to loss. Um, Skinner, you will recall, um, of the levers and uh, behaviorism, um, believed that it's a learned behavior. I just want to go and take an aside here. Uh, depression is not a learned behavior. Um, <laughs> but uh, there, there are some behavioral approaches that are very effective in, in treating it. Um, Cognitive psychology believes that it's a misinterpretation of events. This is a little closer. Um, I think that for some people, um, the way that we are raised to see the world and um, to kind of interpret things around us can absolutely 100% play into depression. Um, and then the medical model believes that it is uh, basically just a neurotransmitter or hormonal imbalance. It's worth noting here that um, there are plenty of diseases that mimic depression. Um, hypothyroidism is just uh, the example that popped into my head, but um, there are there are multiple ones that that look like depression. Um, some look like anxiety, some look like other things. But this is a good reminder to make sure that you talk to your doctor first. Okay. Um, so treatment. Um, the treatment approaches uh, have, like I, like I referenced before, you can get your exorcism or um, versions of electroconvulsive therapy start in the 1700s. Um, so, you know, you'd be hooked up to, to something electrical and you'd get shocked. Um, there's a reason why this has been used for, you know, 400 years. It's, it's basically that, um, you know, it works, <laughs> you know. Uh, I'll, we'll talk more about ECT as we go on. Did I say 400, 300 years? Um, it does work though. So uh, I said, Asaniazid, I think is probably how it's pronounced, um, is actually an antibiotic. It's, um, it's used for um, the treatment of tuberculosis. And they found while they were treating people for, for tuberculosis that they, their mood was improved. So that is the first proto um, medication treatment for depression. Um, lobotomies come around in the 1930s. This is not a, uh, a bright time in psychological history. Um, basically, it's psychoactive surgery. You go and you remove part of the brain. Um, you know, I think it makes sense that if you remove part of the brain, sometimes a lot of the brain, it's going to have effects on, on how people are in the world. Um, they tended to be very sedating, but 
it's a little of throwing the baby out with the bathwater on this one. So um, I suppose if what you are considering to be effective is that the person is then uh, calm and quiet, then they were successful. But again, really barbaric. Um, tricyclics are the first really modern um, uh, antidepressant medications. They uh, are still used here and there, but not very often because there are some really serious side effects with tricyclics, um, not the least of which is that there is a, um, a potential for overdose. They can, they can kill you if you overdose on them, which um, if you're treating somebody for depression, is um, a real problem. So uh, they are not, they're not really in favor. There are a lot better drugs out there now. Um, there was a big gap between tricyclics and Prozac, which came out in 1987. It's the first um, SSRI, um, but there are many now. And, um, and there are other uh, categories of antidepressants now, but Prozac is really the one that, uh, that set us on the, the most modern path of medication treatment for depression. And now we have many, many, many um, medications, um, many of whom are very effective, many of which are very effective, um, but you're not here to learn about medication. You're here to learn about what else you can do. So, all right, so um, the first thing that I want to raise beyond medication is um, activity, nutrition, and weight. And they're obviously all related, so I put them on the same slide. Um, it doesn't really matter what activity you do, it's that you do activity. So, you know, I, I put 10,000 steps on here because that's um, a relatively easy thing to do that most people can do relatively easily. But, you know, if going to the pool is something that's, that's easier for you or you can't do 10,000, but you can do 2,000, um, you know, it's, it's more important that you do something and all the better if you can do it on a schedule. So consistency is really key here. And so you wanna be really careful that you don't pick something um, out of a, a fit of motivation and then um, lose all your motivation in a week and quit doing it. So make sure that you don't overpace yourself. Set goals that are reasonable and stick to them. Um, this can be much easier said than done when you are depressed. So, you know, you might, you might find yourself um, picking very, uh, what might seem to be low bar kind of goals. I would much rather see folks pick very low bar goals and then raise the bar than try to jump a bar that's too high and not make it. So yeah, definitely start wherever you are, wherever that really happens to be. Um, so as for diet, try to maintain as clean a diet as you can. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have cheeseburgers, that's not what I mean. But you know, there are foodstuffs out there that will make you feel um, worse in the end. Um, caffeine and sugar are definitely um, at the top of this list. But you know, going back to that burger, um, has anybody ever had the McBlues? I definitely have. You know, you go out, you go to McDonald's, you have a big burger and a big, you know, bucket of fries, and um, you do really not feel very well afterwards. And um, it is, it is better for your mental health to eat the sort of clean whole foods. So, you know, go to the farmer's market if you can, you know, if you have a green thumb, grow your own tomatoes, whatever, you know, and, and try to stay away from things that are processed. Um, because again, they tend to have a lot of sugar. They tend to have a lot of um, other things that can affect your brain. MSG comes to mind. So just kind of try to avoid that if you can. Um, maintaining a healthy weight, there, I, I, there could, I could do a whole presentation on why this is important for depression, but um, basically it's good for your body and it's also good for your self-image. Those two things are pretty much of equal weight, I feel, in, in this conversation. Um, you know, our society uh, is very, skewed towards making us feel not so great about ourselves when our when our bodies are um, a little chubbier. So, you know, it, it's better for for your body 
um, and better for your self-image to maintain that healthier weight. Okay, so alcohol. Um, alcohol comes up again on the next slide, I believe, um, but you should absolutely avoid alcohol if you are struggling with depression. First of all, it is a depressant. It literally makes you more depressed. And also it has a lot of calories. So it's kind of like working against um, your goals on this slide. Okay, so beyond meds, um, sleep hygiene. So this one is hard for people, especially if you have children or you live with a bunch of other people or whatever. But um, if you can get up at the same time every day, including the weekends, it doesn't do you much good if you get up at 5 a.m. Monday through Friday, but then sleep till 10 on the weekends. Um, and um, from this perspective, um, the earlier, the better. So, you know, if, if you, um, the whole idea here, well, not the whole idea, but a lot of the idea here is that um, you get more, um, you get more daylight if you get up earlier. There's a lot of other um, reasons for this, but, but really the earlier you get up and the more consistent you get up, um, the better off uh, you will be in terms of your mental health. Um, really, it is very important that you're very consistent about this. Um, likewise, going to bed at the same time every day is really important. Avoiding blue light before bed, very important. <laughs> so um, that means your TV, your phone, um, a lot of phones have a nighttime mode where it filters out the blue light. If you must look at your phone, pose, you can turn on that filter. Um, but really uh, avoiding artificial light in general, but blue light especially um, before bed is really important for sleep hygiene. And here we are back at avoiding alcohol. So um, alcohol has this interesting effect where it helps you get to sleep, but then it wakes you up a few hours later as your body um, is metabolizing it. It's a bummer. It is not good for your um, sleep hygiene. Also not good for your sleep hygiene, naps. Um, they really do disrupt your circadian rhythm. Um, you know, if, if, if anybody can remember falling asleep on the couch at one o'clock in the afternoon and waking up at four o'clock in the afternoon, especially in the winter when it's dark and how weird and kind of discombobulated you feel, um, that it really messes up your your bodily rhythms and what we're trying to do here is is to um, bring them back into sync so please avoid those naps if you have to go to bed at seven go to bed at seven but don't take naps okay meditation so there's lots and lots and lots of types of meditation to choose from um, and some of them have very strong evidence bases underneath them um, in their own right. So meditation in general is an evidence-based uh, practice for, um, for all sorts of things, anxiety, depression, that sort of, that sort of stuff. But um, there are types that do have their own evidence base. That being said, you should pick what works for you. Um, try things, you know, go, go download some of the apps, go look on YouTube for different meditations. Some people like you know, guided um, progressive uh, relaxation meditation. Some people like just relaxing music and imagery. There's all sorts of different ways to go about it. Um, and you can create your own. If you're in my psychology of stress class, you have created your own. Um, so meditation is also very effective. Okay, light therapy. Um, this is something you can buy. Uh, basically, you buy a, um, a very bright lamp, 10,000 um, lux is incredibly bright, and um, it's mainly for seasonal affective disorder sufferers, but um, that's a lot of people, first of all, and second of all, um, I'm pretty sure that there's, that, that there's uh, positive effects for any type of depression in, in the winter, especially. Um, the reasons for this are complicated, but, uh, but they're easily researched and make a wonderful paper. Um, so at least 30 minutes a day, best right after you get up in the morning. Um, the closer, the better typically, but be really careful about this because if you're on meds already, bright light therapy can interact with them. So just, again, talk to your doctor. Are you sensing a theme here? 
All right. So social support. So in general, health outcomes are better for people with high levels of or high quality of social support. Um, this is especially true for depression and especially true for men. Um, again, the reasons for this are complicated, but um, if you are a man who has uh, not a lot of social support and are suffering from depression, um, getting out there and making some friends, though possibly weird and complicated, especially in time of COVID, um, has been shown to be uh, effective for helping to manage uh, symptoms of depression. Okay, so therapy. Yes, we were going to get here eventually. Um, there are lots of different kinds of therapy available. Um, there, there's clinicians with all sorts of orientations out there. Um, what works for you might be different than what works for somebody else, depending on you know how how you think and um, how you process things and just basically what your preferences are. Um, my preference is always to steer people towards evidence-based practices first um, if they're available to you. Um, but again, you know, you might be drawn to something in particular that doesn't necessarily have an evidence base and you should start with what you think is going to work with you best. What I would advise though is not getting um, too devoted to any one modality if you uh, try a therapist or a type of therapy and it's not working for you, don't just throw up your hands and say, therapy doesn't work for me. That's not the way to handle it. Um, try, try again. You know, not, not everybody meshes with their therapist. Not everybody meshes with the modality. Um, keep, keep working on it, you know, um, keep, keep trying. Okay, so stress management. Um, this might feel a little bit redundant, but like a lot of what we've already discussed also applies to helping you manage stress, right? Like, so, you know, exercise and nutrition and all of that. If you're in my psych of stress class, you know this, but remember that managing your stress is very effective in managing depression too. And we're not just talking here about like, you know, uh, applying things like good nutrition and exercise to, to managing stress. We're talking about here, um, you know, figuring out what's going on at work that you can you can reduce the stress that's coming from that or within your family or, you know, turning off your phone for a few hours every night or not doom scrolling through the New York Times every day or, you know, all these other things, right? So there's a lot of um, stress management issues out there in the world that, you know, if you can get away from that kind of stress that you're experiencing, you very well might see good effects um, on your depression. Okay, so herbal. Um, or, you know, this might feel too medication-y to some of you, but um, there are a lot of herbal remedies. Um, so, I just listed a few here and you know there there is some evidence base for all of the ones that that I listed there's evidence base for other ones too what you want to do is um is as always talk to your doctor you can try these but they are not as a rule as effective as as a medication intervention would be right so if you've tried all the other stuff and um, you're you're still not getting where you want to go. Go ahead and you know try this these things, but um, but understand that you know if if you get through this stuff and again you're still not feeling um, as you feel like you should, don't don't throw up your hands. You know like there's there's more to do still. You just might end up in Medland, right? So um, a note on cannabis. Um, people are very pro cannabis for depression. I uh, I'm agnostic on, on, on this topic. I, I admit that I don't know as much about it as I would like to, um, but the research so far is developing and at the moment it's a bit thin. So I'm, I'm not really convinced about cannabis right now. What I do know is that overuse seems to make depression worse. So be really cautious about using cannabis to, to treat depression. 
Um, you know, there are there are a lot of claims out there since it's become very popular in the last decade or so. There's a lot of claims out there. Make sure that you always um, verify and and try to find applicable research. Okay, so last slide. Um, there is no way to talk about medication free treatment for depression without talking about electroconvulsive therapy. So. ECT, um, again, 1700s, you know, 300 years ago, there's something to it, but it's, it's, not, it's not easy, right? Um, it, it is for severe cases only. Um, it does require, in modern times anyway, um, being put under. Um, it's not like the movies, you know, we've all seen the movies where the person is given ECT and they, and they have um, like a visible seizure. You do have a seizure, but um, as you are anesthetized, it, is, it isn't something that you can, you know, see with a movie camera. Um, this is really something that um, is reserved for when nothing else has worked, not just because it can be dangerous, you know, being anesthetized is, is dangerous. It comes with risks. Um, but also because, you know, there is some real stigma attached to this and there are some real side effects as well. You know, um, side effects include, you know, memory issues. It's just, it's, it's, it's not problem free, but it is very effective, you know, for folks who have tried everything, it can be really effective. Um, and it's fast. I mean, this is something where, you know, if somebody is severely, severely depressed or catatonic or, you know, in the middle of a schizophrenic episode or whatever, it is very effective and very quick. Um, I just want to mention very briefly um, TMS. It, it is a, a newer kind of intervention. Um, it's not quite as invasive. There is no seizure. Um, I just want to mention that that that, um, that that's a newer kind of um, re relative to, e to ECT. All right. Okay. So if you have any questions, as always, um, send me a message. I will be happy to do another recording or a discussion post or whatever is useful to you. Uh, remember, always talk to your doctor first. All right, everybody. Have a good one.